right, we're gonna try to get one more in. And as is tradition, we will begin with the initial setup of the board. All right, halfway through turn one, Chris is definitely changing it up and trying something different with the axis, and namely a J1 attack. So he's put quite a bit into that initial Pearl Harbor raid, wiping out my Navy quite easily there and in the Philippines as well. Last game, uh, with our military base being in the Philippines, um, him not taking Philippines first turn met, but they were building up two infantry every turn, reinforced with uh, Anzac aircraft. So that was something he was never able to take. Thorn on his side, and he decided to do something about that this time. Quang Tung falls in a few Chinese territories as well. Um, but, you know, still hanging on in other places. The battleship is still there. Um, so changing up the J1 uh, rhythm a little bit. Chris tends to be more of the overwhelming force in individual battles guy, so he has certainly done that. Took each one of these territories first time uh, instead of spreading himself out thin like uh, I'd be normally inclined to do. On the German side is a full Russia first uh, focus uh, by all appearances. He bought 10 infantry for his first purchase, so he's got crap ton of land units, did the Yugoslavian do -si do there, so they're all along the Russian border. Took that one bonus, not being at war with Russia the first turn, don't see that coming the second turn. Uh, and so the allies, including the US, gearing up for the rest of turn one. In the second turn of the game, the Americans have responded to uh, the Japanese invasion by spending most of their money in the Pacific, building up thusly. The Anzacians have uh, mostly done that as well, um, buying a transport to replace the transport that they just shot out to Java, building up and taking advantage of that first turn round of bonuses. The uh, Indians, uh, filling the gap left by uh, all the Japanese uh, in the Hawaiian sector are spreading their wings a wee bit and uh, filling in on Yunnan. Um, kind of a combined effort there between uh, three different nations to push the Japanese back a bit. Um, and meantime, on the European front, the Italians have focused heavily on North Africa, as uh, tends to be Chris's strategy here with the Italians, focusing on that bonus there. Um, in Europe, we see clear division and resources here, east and west, between the Italians and Germans. Uh, Germans having left all the goodies there for the Italians to get, and no doubt will be uh, tackling France soon. Um, We've got uh, a bit of a build up there. So Taranto uh, was implemented again, went well for the allies this time, left a carrier full of planes, took one hit, I think. And um, the Italians took it back this time, yeah, waiting for the uh, Germans to come down and reverse Taranto the, the, there. So we got a mess of planes on Malta. We've got a little bit of build up uh, in the Atlantic. The French fleet was able to survive. And we'll see what Germany does on round two. Halfway through turn two, Japan has made its intentions known by bringing the southern fleet all the way down yonder. Imagine what that looks like to the Australians right now. A whole lot of hurt coming down the horizon. And over in China, they're spreading out pretty quickly there, up and down the border with China and France. And on the European front, as uh, again, uh, telegraphed pretty clearly, the Germans have launched full-scale invasion of Russia. 
uh, to the point where they bought 10 tanks this turn, 10 infantry the past turn. I think this is turning out to be an experiment on can Germany actually take Russia if it goes full bore and does nothing else. So that's what's happening so far. How will the uh, Allies do their half of turn two? At the beginning of turn three, the U.S. has zigged as Japan zags and brown its uh, navy up to the north, dropping some folks in Siberia next to an unguarded Japan. The Chinese and Indians have continued to supplement uh, the Allied push down here in Southeast Asia, uh, even taking uh, French Indochina and uh, Get rid of the sub that was convoying me here, so we're still hanging on to a couple of the money islands. Um, Japan having taken the Gilbert Islands solely for the purpose of taking away one of Anzac's bonuses. Anzac came up and got this one for another. So there is some back and forth in South Pacific. Uh, we see a little bit of spread here, taking advantage of the bonuses to build some extra guys. Chinese still uh, in, in possession of the Burma Road, so building a couple artilleries on top of that. In the rest of the Southern Hemisphere here, uh, we are taking up uh, more of the Middle East. We took Iraq and built a factory in Persia, as uh, has become the norm. Building up in Egypt as much as possible, while the, uh, the Italians here start spreading out from the Horn and consolidating in Libya to avoid the pressure from the folks in Egypt. U.S. and a combined Allied fleet here, having uh, gone to season 91, as one might expect. Got the, uh, the French ships still alive, kind of nipping at the med uh, by the end of turn two to try and start taking some of Italy's bonuses as well. You see uh, the U.S splitting its builds, most of it in the Atlantic, but not all. We put some stuff in the Pacific as well <sighs> to prepare ourselves for what the Axis will do on turn three. In the middle of turn three, and it has not disappointed. So Japan has swung around and rearranged itself, taken the prize in Hawaii that it was handed on a silver platter. And so we have... Uh, couple carrier groups there out in Hawaii and the other half of the Navy swung over this way and took the money islands in a very uh, IPC rich move so that is a plus 10 in bonuses for Japan with those two moves together uh, Japan continuing to mosey its way into China one big stack at a time uh, it was kind of uh, kind of pushed into buying defensive units here in Japan, which of course was the plan. Um, purchased all infantry this time around, I think 14 infantry. Yep. Uh, the, two of those being built in Shanghai. How'd you build six in a military base? I didn't. I moved four in from your G-hole. Oh, okay. He came up out of his G-hole and into Chahar. <laughs> now he has six... Uh, infantry there and the rest in Japan. But anyway, that was a all land units purchased this time around. Russia, feeling the pinch over here, uh, has resorted to the, uh, the age-old Yakut airstrip tactic um, while also building up defensive units in Moscow because Germany's just coming like a bandit with uh, some Italians coming up behind as well. So this is how much they already own uh, Russia, not even pretending to hold on to Nogoro, but did push back a little bit, sent some planes up to whittle those uh, guys in Karelia down and then backed off once the infantry were gone. But otherwise, just a whole spread of blockers here while the Nazis come barreling at them. And uh, behind them, is this uh, ragtag allied fleet that's uh, still been building up for only a couple turns. So how are they going to slow the Axis down this turn? By the beginning of turn four, the action continues. 
U.S. having uh, pulled back as far as it can to Alaska while uh, continuing to drop some fellows off in Russia that march over. We've built up a little ground force in uh, western U.S. in uh, what Japanese decide they want to do. Anzac, with uh, a little bit of breathing room, starts to build a navy and together with Calcutta has taken out uh, a couple transports. Yeah, it's a price to pay, but uh, on balance, it's a good idea to keep those transports to a minimum. UK uh, Pacific also building a little bit of a navy, a little, uh, little tiny navy if it could, building up a little nub there, while uh, continuing to try and hold Southeast Asia. Pulling back a little bit as we must. Um, meanwhile, the UK has completed its conquest of the Middle East while splitting its efforts between both North Africa and reinforcing Southern Russia. U.S. doing the same and, uh, you know, inching its way along, but Italy making a power play for Tunisia. So uh, slowing down our role just a little bit. Now, will the Axis continue this momentum on turn four? Well, this unusual game continues to develop here on turn four. The Japanese have thrown everything they could at the American Navy and prevailed, leaving them with a the first victory token of the game. So under the house rules, eliminating all surface warships from uh, the Pacific for the U.S. earns Japan a victory token. They've done that. They earned heavy bombers as a result and now have pretty much complete domination of the Pacific. Now he's, his navy's spread out certainly, but it's uh, working to his advantage with all the uh, bonuses that come along with it. He's hauling in 67 IPCs this turn, so that ain't nothing. Um, we have domination of the money islands, continuing to creep into China. It's a pretty big stack right there in Shenzhen, thanks to the factory that's been turning out tanks every turn and military base along with it. So on the Russian front, as you would imagine, Germans pulling forward with everything they've got. A huge stack there in Bryansk. Uh, they did take Ukraine. One, uh, one take back Russia was able to pull off was uh, throwing some, some troops and paratroops and planes in there to retake the Ukrainian factory. Uh, we have British and Americans all coming in this turn. Uh, the reason Japan was able to take out the uh, American Navy is because they sacrificed all their planes to get them to the Yakut air airstrip. We've got British and American planes that came in from Scotland last turn, been positioned there just so they could get to that spot and get to Moscow on time, but uh, Germany keeps churning out the troops back this way, and the U.S. strategy is certainly uh, floundering on the water, so let's see what we can do to slow down the advance on turn four. Now beginning turn five, the Americans have done what they can to build a retaliatory and defensive force here in the Pacific, spending their entire build, unfortunately, in doing so. The um, Anzacians are just quietly building what they can build, which isn't a whole lot right now, since most of the bonuses are gone. Um, the Indians kind of creeping up a little bit, not really accomplishing a whole heck of a lot at the moment. But the Chinese are uh, building up what looks like a last stand at this point. Japan coming in as close as they have done in living memory here to actually taking all of China, so that's pretty impressive. The uh, <coughs> Allied reinforcement of Moscow is now complete. All the different planes that have been sent that way are there. And the Italians have come and uh, buttressed the German presence here 
uh, on the edge of Russia in Bryansk, hoping to uh, prevent a retaliatory strike and uh, reversal of the Axis momentum. U UK doing what they can, which isn't a whole heck of a lot, but they've got a factory set up going, kicking out some mobile units every turn, kind of holding the corners of North Africa and waiting for the coming onslaught of turn five. Halfway through turn five, the Japanese are skedaddling out of Alaska, but backed up by a new Navy built here in Japan where the amphibious assault has uh, taken place on the other side, wiped out the Americans that were up there. It's okay, they did their job. We have all sorts of Japanese buildup up here. They are dead serious about taking China and getting rid of the remaining Chinese forces that are uh, currently buttressed by the Russians as well. The last stand there, but we took out some of the uh, Indians that were down there in Yunnan, built up all sorts of power, about the last bit of Air Force on Asia, all piled up right there, while the Russians continue to turtle. Here in Bryansk, we finally resorted to a blow-up box. That's everything that's sitting there, both German and Italian. We were able to uh, push uh, clear out Archangel, but not take it back. And uh, it looks deceptively empty there, but it's all it's all strategically covered. In Germany proper, we're building up a little bit more air force and a few ground units here on the defensive side, and even moving Germany's navy out into the open to uh, project some power against the anemic Allied Atlantic's fleet, which uh, has its work cut out for him here on the rest of the turn. Now halfway through turn six, Japan reacting to the Allied moves with a vengeance. You'll see completely reorienting its uh, force orientation from northern China, which it has more or less retreated from, northwestern China, and uh, bringing everything down to the Philippines, that's its entire navy, uh, was just not going to have that uh, eaten away at its southern core here anymore. So completely giving up on its uh, northern activities here and pulling back. One reason is that the Russians swung everything that had come over from Siberia into Singhai, um, that was a real debate on my end, which way to send those troops. But uh, if the China was going to hold on at all, it was going to have to include uh, all those Russians coming to reinforce them. And why is it important for China to hold on? Not necessarily for China's sake, but because once that wall finally falls, all these Japanese forces pour into Russia as well. So that's as much a defensive move for Russia um, as it is anything else. So that's why Russian troops needed to go there. Uh, Germany, as I predicted, um, has swung its offensive uh, capabilities down towards the Caucasus. Uh, myself, I would have expected it to be a little bit more aggressive uh, in getting down to the Caucasus um, at that turn. But instead, the Italians came back and retook Ukraine after the British had taken it. So that tells me that he wants to build things there. Um, but he's got all of his German troops, just about everything that was there down into Rostov, which can make an easy play down in both Caucasus and Volgograd next time. So the Russians um, took back some of these border territories that Germany had taken. Bryansk, uh, terrible, terrible rolls, uh, got the guys out of there, had to lose a plane in order to do that and uh, ended up not taking the territory itself. Uh, that's okay, though, because uh, it opened up a pathway for the rest of the Allies to get to Ukraine, which I think is going to be important because I want those Italian can openers out of there. Um, I had expected him to can open one of these territories last time is what I'm going for. I expected him to take Rostov so that he could shoot his tanks down this way. He's being more conservative. He's escorting those tanks with the 19... Um, infantry and artillery and all that other jazz so that he can't lose them as easily. Um, but he's still got a head start on me. So uh, 
Um, that's going to be a tough one here for the Allies because we knew that was a possibility. It's why we started building up, why we built another military base, but we're going to have to put them all to the test, especially with the Japanese coming to put pressure on Calcutta now um, after all this time. So the U.S. has got a lot to bite off. Uh, the Germans also bought subs enough to make a wolf pack, bought a destroyer this time so that he can actually defend against subs, and uh, it's not looking good here um, for the Allies and keeping this momentum. We're going to have to uh, reshift back on the rest of turn six. All right, halfway through, or no, rather at the beginning of turn six. Uh, so this was a good game, and we weren't able to finish it in Dallas, so we've relocated and set it up on two boards again. First thing the U.S. did was take care of that fleet in three and had really good rolls on its surprise shots, so it took them all out with uh, no feedback, no, no fire back uh, from the Japanese. So that was a good start to this turn for the Allies, and the Allies have done pretty well in, in regaining lost territory here on the rest of the turn. So uh, Anzac... Um, while currently free from Japanese pressure, that certainly don't necessarily last forever, but with the Japanese tied up up in the north and in China, uh, both Anzac and Calcutta are doing what they can to add pressure down on the bottom. So uh, each has built up a fleet and it has taken two of the money islands, and well, Japan is out of range to take them back this turn, so that's going to be an economic hurt, starting to do some convoying. So that'll be nice. More uh, more Indian forces heading this way, taking uh, Vietnam and Yunnan. So um, not letting the Japanese get away with just focusing on northern China for sure. Uh, UK Europe has started its Middle Eastern factory uh, system, churning out uh, mobile units out of the military industrial complex over here. We've finally cleaned up southern Africa, so we've just got one little Italian infestation there in Libya. Unfortunately, allies are a bit stretched in Europe, so that Italian presence may last a while. And that uh, that stings a bit because the Italians building up a fleet here that's a transport and two uh, destroyers, um, supporting any uh, invasion aspirations they may have, which Chris certainly will have. Um, while he continues to push forward on the European front. Now, uh, it's going to be really interesting to see what the Axis do here on turn six. The uh, That stack of 20-something uh, tanks is uh, a, a big one. And if I were a betting man, I would bet he was going to try and do what I attempted and failed to do last time I played Axis which was to take that whole stack of mobile units that's right there next to Russia. And now that he realizes he's not going to get anywhere through all that reinforcement of allied planes that have sacrificed themselves in order to get there, I think he's going to zig and he's going to go down into the Middle East and try to wipe out that factory production. So we'll see what the Axis do here in the rest of turn six. By the beginning of turn seven, the... Axis momentum shows little sign of slowing down. Um, we see that the U.S. has finally taken back Hawaii. Um, opted not to uh, go to Midway as well. Didn't want to put my transport in range of those what are now heavy bombers. We haven't mentioned they got heavy bomber technology from wiping out all the U.S. Navy a few turns ago. Anzac has uh, skedaddled its Navy in both directions. Uh, and bought some offensive units here to defend Sydney in case that's the direction he goes. I kind of have a feeling he's going to put the pressure on Calcutta, but we'll see. Um, I mean, Sydney, we've got these fighters that can get to Queensland or Sydney if they need to. Um, these fighters might be out of luck, actually. Uh, this couple transports here in Hawaii can make it to Queensland if they have to. Um, not to say that we would necessarily hold against a full throttled press against Sydney, but uh, we could at least put up a fight. Over here, we've consolidated the Navy in India and uh, built mech units and started to pull back the land units. Yeah, we took out those guys in Yunnan to slow down the Japanese advance, but um, it's, uh, it's still, I don't have the infantry here that I could have uh, just been building up this whole time. 
and he knows that he's got uh 12 infantry artillery tank all sorts of good stuff here planes up the wazoo he built an airstrip up in shanghai to bring these five tack bombers down and got more planes over here so if he wants to hit calcutta as i think he may um i could be in trouble i could be in trouble uh, especially since we know now for sure that he's bringing that German move down into the Middle East. Um, those Italian uh, can openers did in fact open the can um, down here in the Caucasus. I brought the British down. They took out the German AA guns, but I rolled poorly. He rolled well. Um, I could have pressed, kept pressing it, uh, chose not to, pulled those planes back, ultimately decided that They'd be better on the defensive down here in the Middle East than the offensive. Uh, mm, you know, it may or may not have been the right move, uh, but it was the move that was made. So uh, we can expect Germany to park everything it has, including planes, down here in the Caucasus next turn. And uh, that could get ugly. It could get real ugly. Um, I don't like where this is going at all. Um, so we'll see. The U.S. built up most of its builds here this navy over here kept uh, what was in play in range of the uk in case that becomes important um but i am took gibraltar just because but you know he's building 20 something a turn building transports here into the med uh, i'm sure italy is going to go into egypt soon because he's starting to move these folks over <sighs> a lot of pressure here in the Middle East and I don't like it. I do not like it at all. We'll see how they keep the pressure up on turn seven. Halfway through turn seven and it's getting real in South Asia. Japan has built a minimal uh, defensive force in the homeland, although sufficient by all accounts. And um, as one might have predicted, uh, threw everything it had towards Calcutta making a big, big incursion into Burma to wipe out uh, a good chunk of Calcutta's land forces, foregoing the money islands and so not taking nearly as much um, income as they could have, but uh, certainly uh, making a break for Calcutta at all costs. At the same time, Germany hitting UK from the other end uh, piling, again, as one might have predicted, everything it has into uh, the Caucasus to put the squeeze there on the UK's presence in the Middle East. Now, Russia has responded by repositioning everything it can get to um, Kazakhstan and uh, building up a defensive wall, sure to be supplemented by other allies by the time Germany's next turn comes around. And... Uh, make a threat on the folks there in the Caucasus. But Germany's not going anywhere on the southern front, even having spent uh, the money to build a major factory in Romania to uh, keep its supply lines going. A little bit of naval action up in the Atlantic, but otherwise uh, in Germany clearing out the factory in France so that it could build there. Uh, but otherwise all of its focus here on the Middle East. So uh, we know what the Axis are committed to doing. What can the Allies do to slow down that plan on the rest of turn seven? Now at the beginning of turn eight and things are getting real. So the U.S. investing most of its money in the Pacific with uh, another reinforcement of its fleet coming to join what has uh, piled up in Hawaii. So this is a representation of me trying to get into Allied mode. See, I'm usually uh, the one to send attackers everywhere and kill as much as I can as the Axis, well, I still can. Uh, and that was my temptation to send those subs into C-Zone 6. They certainly could have sunk the aircraft carrier and destroyer that were there, but those planes that were ready to respond would have wiped out the six subs, and that would have been a net IPC benefit to Japan. Um, so even though it would have been gratifying to uh, be able to raid C-Zone 6, it wouldn't really accomplish much strategically certainly not as much as amassing a fleet this big in hawaii so uh that's i think the right move the slow growth move for the allies there um anzac building uh some subs and and a plane a little bit of offensive capability there um uk doing what it can built uh all 
infantry here, kept the mechs there. I could have pulled those mechs out and made the Eastern Persian uh, force there even bigger, but uh, I need, and I could pull that plane out obviously too, but I need a speed bump here, right? I need to um, take out as much of this huge, huge uh, land uh, unit, uh, land stack that he's managed to uh, amass there in Burma so quickly. Uh, I need to slow that down as much as possible. Now, he's going to come at me with so much air force, um, it's going to be ridiculous. So, yeah, who knows? It may not have even been worth it, but uh, I think that that needs to be done. I think some resistance needs to be applied there. The Navy pulling back uh, to C Zone 80 uh, and building what I can in the Middle East uh, while continuing to pile up uh, this force here in Kazakhstan. And we're basically relocating the Moscow force down to Kazakhstan um, and being able to pull those guys out of Singhai because he pulled his Japanese forces. Uh, out of Shenzhen, uh, so that helps, and that certainly, you know, gives uh, hopefully gives him pause here in the Caucasus to see well how far is he really willing to stick his neck out as Germany? How far out of position is he able to get um, before I can stop him up here with this uh, combined Allied force? Um, trouble is, I mean, with all these Japanese coming roaring through Calcutta. Italy this turn invading and taking um, Egypt, it's um, mm, it's it's tough. It's really tough because um, he could be ahead of the curve here. He could gobble up Jordan um, this turn. Though those tanks in the Caucasus could easily sweep down, uh, take both my factories in Iraq and Persia, and then uh, what am I left with? We have solid access control of the Middle East with factories to boot. Uh, yeah, I've got a lot of guys there, but uh, which direction are they going to go, right? Are they going to take India? Are they going to try to retake the Middle East? Uh, what are these guys going to do to help these Russians? The Russian tanks can get there, but uh, the rest of it can't. So um, it's going to be interesting. Of course, the Germans can't get those infantry past northwest Persia either. And query whether he's going to split those forces up and make them easier for me to pick off. Um, that remains to be seen. Meanwhile, the U.S. doing what it can over here, bringing the fleet back down. Uh, another battleship there coming up behind it, but certainly uh, anytime there's a fleet that big in 91, especially now that the Germans have moved their Air Force out and their Navy isn't big enough to match mine, um, now Germany needs to be concerned, needs to start doing uh, some rear guard action there. And uh, Italy, with all this land it's owning, certainly is getting way too much money and it's big and ugly. Um, so they're, but, but they're still, they're still a bit soft right in here. If I really wanted to go hard into the Mediterranean. So, uh, hopefully that slows them down a little bit, but uh, we'll see which way Jeremy wants to go here on turn eight. Now halfway through turn eight and it is easily the most consequential for the axis so far. You see a little bit of, uh, building up there. You see some retrenchment in China, but all for good reason. As one had expected, uh, the Japanese have rolled right through Calcutta, gaining the technology of improved production along the way. Japan also gobbled up both of the money islands they were missing. And because the Allies neglected to drop a naval blocker in either of these two sea zones, uh, brought their fleet into West India. Why is that important? Well, it's strategic depth for Calcutta. Uh, had I put that blocker, which I left myself a note to do, but still didn't do, um, they would not have taken West India. I would have rolled these 11 tanks back into Calcutta and likely taken it back. Um, it might not have been the best move with all these guys coming in, but I still would have done it. And they would never would have gotten that tech roll. So, and now they get a chance to build in that industrial complex that's sitting there and get to spend all of India's money to do it. So that's just horrible. That's really horrible for the Axis, or for the Allies rather. Um, but you'll notice that UK still has the Middle East, which is not the situation I expected, frankly, after Germany's turn. That's because Germany, instead of going into the uh, Middle East, actually took the bait, uh, or what, you know, I had considered bait, really, and, and poured everything into Kazakhstan. Uh, they took it, and uh, with incredible rolling uh, with uh, Chris's blue dice, and only average rolling on my side, uh, they took it with quite some force, had six tanks left over, didn't lose a single 
aircraft. So all of the Allied Air Force that had been there, gone. And all of the Russian tanks, gone. And uh, that IPC swing is beyond calculation at this point. If we would have sat down and added that up, it would have been incredible. Uh, of course, my second strike, as intended, came and wiped out the remaining tanks, but that's all right. Germany has all of those planes and bombers uh, sitting in its little secondary base in Romania there. Uh, Russia's spreading out and getting some of their territory back. That's great. Um, still don't have this factory and won't get it anytime soon. Uh, while Germany still sits here with plenty of strategic depth in Europe. Of course, the uh, Americans are there, but the Germans are already starting to build with a lot of infantry and air force and everything else um, uh, ready for them in Europe. The German Navy pulling back a little bit, taking out that last Russian sub for, you know, unknown reasons. Um, probably because this fleet was coming in. And now it's up to the Allies to get the momentum started up again here on the rest of turn eight. As we reach the beginning of turn nine, it's a little bit difficult to put it all in context because this game has been spread out over time here during the summer. But I'll tell you what just happened in the last half turn. The uh, U.S. is slowly building up its navy here in Hawaii, not getting too adventurous. Uh, did take out this destroyer over here. Um, Anzac, same thing, building up slowly, taking out a transport, taking an opportunistic uh, land grab there in Vietnam. Otherwise, biding its time uh, in the Middle East, the UK is reconstructing, building some infantry, pulling back the navies here to the Horn of Africa. Not going too far in either direction, but uh, certainly uh, pinched on both sides. A little extra navy down there. Uh, so the UK and Italy have traded Egypt back and forth. Uh, UK took it back from Italy and Italy came right back again and uh, stormed uh, into Cairo and took that back. So we've got a little bit of back and forth on that end. Uh, Romania continues to be a hotbed of military industrial production with uh, both Axis powers uh, doubling up in there. Italy, huge build into land units as the Allied Navy uh, makes a move and relocates up to London. That's uh, pretty messy right now, but we've got American infantry in Normandy, Holland, and Denmark, while the rest of the Navy hangs out there in 110. So, um, finally picking a direction to apply some pressure on the Axis, and that's on the northern front. That's why Italy feels uh, able to flex a little bit down there in the Mediterranean. And we've got a little bit of reinforcement on each side coming, but what is the Axis going to do in response on turn nine? Now halfway through turn nine, and the Japanese have come out with force. Home islands here still not heavily defended, although some subs and such built there. Um, some pushback in China, as one might expect, taking back a couple territories. But, of course, the real action, as one might have expected, is filling out the Japanese Empire here in Southeast Asia. So, taking Malaya, pretty strategic territory, as well as Indochina, West India again. The uh, Japanese Navy uh, resisting the invitation to come even further out of position here into... Uh, the Indian Ocean and pulling back all the way to 38. Um, still a crap ton of aircraft and of course nine additional infantry built down here in uh, India for a total of 16 and a whole lot of other nastiness. So quite a bit coming in. Japanese even reinforcing Egypt with a few planes, a couple planes there that were in reach. Germany as you see has uh, helped out by clearing out the Navy there with that bomber. Germany also uh, spreading out with force all over uh, its fronts as well. You see that the uh, Axis are lined up here along the Ural Mountains, taking back several of the territories uh, that were left open by the Russians. Certainly not 
uh, pulling back on the Russian aggression uh, very much on that front there, uh, despite the Allied push into the UK. Have quite a large force up here in Nenezia, hoping to just sneak around the Russians and get on up into Siberia. We'll see what if that happens or not. Um, but certainly a lot being churned out in this factory in Romania and all the bombers and such supporting these uh, invasions and incursions into Russian territory. Russians took a couple back. They took Smolensk back. They took Vologda back, which were held by the Nazis. Um, but that's all that they could do. On the Atlantic side, you see the Germans consolidating their navy here, building a carrier. Um, that's all I've broken down. He's using a blow up box there, taking back everything that was in uh, American hands there along the coast. And they're all set up here um, to anticipate the Allied push on turn nine. As we reach turn 10, no huge shifts, but the uh, slow Allied tsunami is building up here in the Pacific as we uh, move to take the Carolines and uh, reinforce that with some Anzac pieces as well. Um, kind of demonstrating by contrast here that the home islands really starting to look under defended, but not like I can do anything about it just yet. Uh, whereas in Southeast Asia, uh, there's a back and forth here on West India again. Um, have a Royal Air Force in the Middle East for, uh, for once. It's been a few turns since the Brits have had any planes, but we're starting to slowly build up there as well. The, uh, ally, the Axis base in Egypt is uh, being evacuated as uh, it appears the Italians won't be able to hold it so they are inching their way leftward while the Allies are inching rightwards. As you see the Navy in 110 decided it was untenable to hold that position anymore so it swung back down to 91. Join up with the battleship there. Got some planes left in London, some planes that came to supplement the fleet in 91. And we have a, a bomber, strap bomber there in Morocco as well. Italians defending the homeland quite nicely, uh, as well as advancing with force into Russia, gathering four more IPCs for their coffers and um, adding more and more uh, pressure to Moscow. We see the Americans kind of come up here to the Urals, trying to plug the gap there for the Russians. And... Otherwise, we have Germany up next, and uh, what will it and Japan do to maintain that Axis momentum? Now halfway through turn 10, and the Axis are uh, advancing that momentum, just like we knew they would. So you see uh, a bigger and bigger navy encircling the home islands, and uh, some action that has taken place, some Predictable action in Asia, but still uh, impressive. Um, they chose to, obviously they had to pull back infantry into Anwe, which is what I was hoping to accomplish by sticking that big force there. So, and they threw in some bombers as well. It's a little bit of expansion, frankly, not as much as I would have predicted. And I'm shooting this video alone here so I can throw in some commentary. Um, the big Japanese push, the real commitment here, obviously they cleaned up this, that was inevitable, this Navy's getting back into position, but uh, um, the real push here is India. So he's built another 10 infantry here, throwing everything else into West India, just absolutely crushing um, South Asia with a goal of coming in here to the Middle East, which obviously <laughs> he's well positioned to do at this point. Um, and and obviously reducing uh, Britain's uh, ability and desire perhaps to go to Egypt, but um, nonetheless, there's uh, you know a, a lot going on here. So the UK uh, is obviously building up to hold up against the Japanese here, but. Um, they also have this opportunity to help uh, finish off North Africa, and there's a real temptation to start filling in here in Russia. Um, so UK is really pressed on every side. Um, speaking of Russia, 
uh, Germany advanced pretty well here uh, all around uh, Moscow to the point where obviously Moscow could have taken back Smolensk and Bryansk. It did take back Vologda. Um, but instead of stretching myself too far here in Russia, I chose to play it uh, conservatively and start building up instead. Germany's not going to invade Moscow anytime soon, um, but he is building 10 infantry for, per turn on the front there between Romania and Leningrad. And he's got this uh, sizable Italian can opener here. So even if I had took Bryansk and Smolensk, uh, those Italians could have come back, taken it, and now he's got a place to park his planes on Germany's turn. So um, there was nothing I could do to keep him off my border. So instead of wasting all my infantry doing that, I chose not to do that. Uh, obviously hanging on to these artillery here, throwing some guys there to support them from... Uh, a possible airstrike because I want to uh, shepherd them into Moscow to rejoin that stack. So now Italy is going to be able to build in Ukraine if it fixes that damage. Um, and that's too bad. Uh, the Japanese are now two Japanese planes in southern Italy just to beef things up. Uh, Germany is focusing on uh, the Russian front uh, and pulling back the tide from uh, West Europe, um, pulling back everybody from the coast, bringing them into France, so on and so forth, uh, pulling out in Denmark, Norway, um, anything they can do to get back on the Russian front here. Uh, since the U.S. has pulled down into the South, I'll tell you, I'm, I'm tempted here to, to what, focus myself on North Africa because that gives me bonuses for the U.S. and ultimately a victory token if I clear it out. Um, and the same front, I am planning to take advantage of Japan's focus on India here uh, by just taking it to him on the Pacific Islands. Now, he might be able to take some of them back eventually, but I get, there are bonuses galore. If I take Philippines, that's five. I probably won't do that because he can just take it back and that's a little too far, but like he just left that open. He's got a military base there. He could have built, he could have spread those 10 infantry around. I could shoot a transport up to Shanghai for that matter and shut down this factory for a turn if I chose to do that. Um, but I'm thinking if I take Guam, that's another bonus. If I take Marianas, Palau, and Marshall, that's another bonus. If I do those plus Okinawa and Iwo Jima, that's a victory token uh, on our board. So uh, I'm looking at how to accomplish that all in one turn so that I get the benefit of that victory token, which is technology. And of course, I've got two Anzac transports here uh, to supplement that effort. So, yes, he's making me hurt in India, but I'm going to make him pay for it uh, in the Pacific. As we reach turn 11, the Allies at least have something to be happy about. We see a continued flow of naval units into the Carolines. But what you will also see is, uh, as I made note of in my prior video, um, we've got Allied transports all over the place, including uh, Okinawa, Iwo Jima, and basically all these little islands except for Guam. reason that's important is that under the House rules, that is a victory token for the U.S. Uh, controlling all those islands. So as a result, the U.S. just got super subs, which is super cool. Um, there's a one or two other technologies that I kind of thought might even play out better, but you know what? Uh, the U.S. is heavy into the naval battle this turn, and this game, and uh, there's subs on both sides of the board. So, uh, hey, I will absolutely take that. That is a great role uh, for the U.S. You see uh, it happens to have its subs uh, spread out and uh, convoying where it can, since at the moment Japan only has two destroyers to its name, so most of those subs are going to live. Um, but it's, it's a good position to be in, uh, in the Pacific there. I mean, Hey, the Axis still has a whole heck of a lot of momentum here, and I am not entirely certain that the Allies are going to win this game. Um, but I'm cautiously optimistic that things are moving in the right direction, at least on this board for this turn. Um, China went and cleaned up a little bit there. That's all to report, built the guy there. Uh, the Brits, as I suggested they would, um, have built up a wall in eastern Persia to counter these guys coming in from India. Now, 
as I calculate them, we're not using odds calculators in this game. That's one of the features of this game. Um, but as I calculate it by hand in my little scribble book, um, the allies still have a slight edge in this battle in terms of odds. Uh, that could go either way. Uh, it's close. I have a slight edge. But hey, let's say, let's say they invade full force and... Uh, you know, I lose and there's a couple tanks left over or whatever, right? Well, those planes can't stay there. They got to go back to India. And I've got this second strike ability here in Persia. So that's helpful. It would have been more helpful to have the two planes that I had stationed in Iraq. There was a plane and attack bomber there. I built those two planes this turn along with some infantry. Uh, Italy made the surprising move of taking both its strat bombers from southern Italy and uh, attacking, bombing those two planes. Uh, they, uh, there's mutual kill on both sides there. I killed his two bombers and he killed my two planes. Um, I certainly was counting on having those planes around here, um, primarily to take back Egypt, which again, traded hands. I took it and he took it back. Uh, but you know what? On balance, I'll, I'll take that trade, right? A plane and attack for his two, only two strats. Um, I'll do that. Do that all day. So that's helpful. He's got his, he's swung his planes down in addition to those strat bombers to take Egypt. He's, so he's obviously really set on taking Egypt. Obviously, it slows me down from taking North Africa. That's probably his end goal. He knows that if I'm committed to it, I'm going to take North Africa. Um, but he's at least slowing me down from doing that, especially when I'm only like dripping in a couple guys at a time from Transjordan here. It's not like I'm coming in with overwhelming force. So uh, each time if he can stop me from advancing, he's accomplishing something there with Italy um, and forcing me to invest more resources. But that said, uh, you know, I've just swung this whole Allied fleet into C-Zone 92, and I'm bringing in uh, American uh, forces. You'll notice uh, I didn't let the Brits take Tunisia because I want the U.S. to take it. So <clears throat> I certainly have the capacity to just swing in here with both navies, first the Americans and then the Brits and then the, the Anzacs into the Med here uh, and wipe out his navy, wipe out his air force, wipe out his remaining forces in Africa uh, all in one turn. That's a good day. That is a great day for me. Um, so he knows that and he's built up some, some forces here in, in Southern Italy to compensate for it. So. Knowing that, what's he going to do about it? Uh, my guess is on Germany's turn, he's probably going to swing this navy up here, which he has, you know, uh, swung back this way last turn and had originally built to counter my American navy. I think he's going to swing it back to 112. I think he's going to position these planes here to uh, be in a position to invade the UK uh, if you know, if, if he chose to do that, I think he's going to put as much pressure as he reasonably can on the UK to get me to swing my Navy back around. They can go one, two, three back into 110 if they needed to. Um, so that's still an option. That said, he has not been shy about the fact that he is making some bold strategic choices here. So in Germany, he has been uh, building... Um, the max capacity of these two factories here in Leningrad and Romania each time. Five uh, infantry each for a total of 10 being added to that front and pumped in every turn. He has been advancing as aggressively as he can along uh, around the uh, north and south of Moscow trying to punch through my line and encircle Moscow and gobble up all of Central Asia. And um, he has been... Uh, relentless about building 10 infantry every turn in Calcutta as well uh, to the at the expense of losing ground in China uh, losing ground in the naval battle so that's all um, consistent with his strategy and he knows that he's you know burning uh, things and losing things in in other respects too he knew obviously that I was going to get and reach for and probably get that uh, victory token that I just took in the Pacific, and that's something he could have prevented if he had built more navy. Chose not to do that, chose not to split his attention, but rather to go whole hog into India. Um, which is why I kind of think he might go all out and attack. 
uh, even because you know, he'll do the same thing he did in Kazakh turn several, Kazakh turns several turns ago, which was, hey, reset, right? Wipe both sides out, get rid of two huge stacks uh, before they're able to, to join forces and become an unstoppable stack because he knows he's got 10 infantry coming out every turn. He may yet think that he's in the better position there if he does that, and he may not be wrong. I, I'm churning out stuff from these factories, but dang, that's that's a lot coming at me here. Uh, you'll notice I threw the two Anzac planes in there, which I had to do in order to balance those odds. Um, but with what he's got coming every turn, you know, he's not going to lose any of those aircraft coming in that invasion battle. They're going to live. Um, I'm sure he'll preserve them. So uh, he may go for broke there in Eastern Persia, and it'll be interesting to see how that happens. Uh, but, like I said, he, he might put some pressure on the UK in the Atlantic to uh, slow my advance in the Mediterranean. But that said, um, he's not going to let it stop him from building 10 infantry in these factories, I don't think. And he's not going to let it stop him from applying his air force against Russia, as he has done down here. Now, that said, I have managed to get him to split his air force up, right? He, he's got a lot of it stationed here in Western Europe just because on a defensive ground. Now that I've chosen to dedicate to the, the med here, instead of sitting in 91, he's gonna reposition those planes. Uh, he's only got, he doesn't even have any Italian planes down there. He's got two Japanese planes in Southern Italy, of all things. So you can bet some of those, if not all of those planes that are in Western Europe are swinging back down to Southern Italy. In fact, that's what I would do if I were him. I would put all of them there, uh, knowing that I've got all these planes here. Now, Let's be real. I don't have enough here to invade southern Italy. I probably, I haven't run, I haven't written out odds or anything, but I probably don't even have enough there right now to invade it just with what's there. But but Chris is not one for uh, taking chances. He's one for overkill. So I imagine he will swoop all sorts of German stuff down into the Italian peninsula. <sighs> that said, though, I am really looking forward to wiping out his Italian navy and parking my uh, American subs and British subs for that matter, right there in C zone 97, doing to him what he always does to me, which is choking me out economically. Uh, in fact, I think he may build some destroyers and mess around with me doing that there, but gonna be hard to do. He's got no Italian Air Force anymore. Um, uh, but my guess is that's exactly why he's investing so much here in this Italian uh, uh, can opener force, which incidentally has uh, just taken Rostov and just built in the Ukraine, uh, because he knows these two IPC territories are where Italy's gonna be getting its money, because uh, they ain't gonna be getting it from uh, the Med or the Italian Peninsula for much longer if things go well, starting on the rest of turn 11. Halfway through turn 11, and the Axis did pretty much what I expected them to, although, uh, at least in Japan's case, not quite as violently. Um, so, you know, it was a given that Japan was going to take out all the transports. That's fine. Um, they did their job. Um, you see, he was very clear about getting rid of all the transports because he left Japan itself woefully underdefended. So you might say, hey, wait a minute, where did that whole fleet go? Well, it's right here. The two fleets having finally rejoined, so uh, up to five carriers and a whole bunch of other stuff there in the Philippines. And down in India, he did not go hard into East Persia like I thought he might with another reset move. And Chris confirms that he thought long and hard about it, but instead playing a longer game and building up there. Certainly more than I can take out with my folks. So I'll have to uh, measure out whether I can uh, reinforce there or if it's time to pull back. In China, you know, we get a little bit of a reprieve. We're going to finally take that military base in Chahar because he's not able to defend it anymore. And the uh, sub strategy has worked pretty well, convoying him for nine IPCs this turn uh, with those three destroyers getting built in 39 to start dealing with that. Uh, on the Russian-German front, uh, there is some exchange back and forth. Took out the folks in Vologda without taking it. That's okay. I'm trying to be very conservative now because I'm getting to the point where 
Um, if I'm not careful, I'm going to leave Russia 200 defended. He did, as one may have expected, uh, come in with a strat bomb, get maximum damage of 20 on that IPC, or on that uh, IC, that industrial complex there. So I've built up some radar towers and some defensive uh, precautions there. He has poured everything into Rostov to make sure he uh, doesn't lose his advance there. And rather than give up on Stalingrad, I poured uh, a whole bunch into that as well to try and defend. In fact, I didn't even have to fix any of the damage in Russia yet this turn. And that'll be certainly coming next turn. And he continues to build up. Um, took out two of the bombers with A guns. That was nice. Uh, he, of course, he built two more. And uh, again, as I mentioned, since he doesn't have to uh, exert any pressure up north, he is trying to swing it down to the south. He did, in fact, bring that navy from 115 to 112, brought all the planes down this way where they could reach the med. But, um, encouragingly, I don't think there are enough planes there to wipe out the navy that I plan to consolidate there in C-Zone 98. Uh, so it will be real fun to see what happens there and see if the Allies can actually push uh, their momentum forward here on the rest of turn 11. Beginning of turn 12, we have the U.S. continuing its uh, funnel, its uh, supply chain down to the Southern Pacific. We've built uh, more subs now, given the fact that we have the uh, super sub technology, throwing in a destroyer there as well just because we're kind of running out of those on the front and we need them to protect against the uh, Japanese subs. These transports swung over from the eastern U.S. and we built a transport in Hawaii so uh, refilling our stock of those as well. Chose not to waste time and waste a destroyer on that Japanese sub but let him live. Swung everything else back down here to C-Zone 54 including two of the Anzac planes that can act as a carrier if you will, and built up some Anzac land units, anticipating that um, there may be a invasion coming. I think, I don't know, he might do that. I kind of think not, but you never know. He could go either way. He's going to need to defend the homeland a bit, right? I've got some subs up there now, convoying him up here. Um, but, you know, he can build to take care of that. Uh, this is now a threat. There's a transport range of C-Zone 6. So all that means is that he's got to build something there. That doesn't necessarily mean he has, has to bring the whole fleet back. And uh, I don't know. I would not be surprised if he starts, if in, or starts an invasion, starts stuff down there. Uh, because this is a defensive fleet. A multinational fleet is always defensive, right? They don't attack together. And so they don't attack very well. So while these are almost precisely evenly powered fleets on a when he's attacking me uh, I can't bring that same amount of power to him so uh, he might attack me and try to do a reset I think that he won't do that because it's a victory token to get rid of all the Japanese capital ships on the board he's not going to risk that um, but I think he's probably not as afraid of me attacking him as I am of him attacking me um, Chinese front does uh, Predictable, took some territories, including that military base in Chahar, in the Middle East, continuing to build up everything that I can there, including uh, some more units to throw into the mix on the following turn. And on the uh, Russian front here, the Italians just pouring everything they can, taking the Caucasus for now anyway, and uh, building three tanks out of Ukraine, which is one thing I really don't love. Uh, in a plane back in the homeland. Uh, the Allies, as anticipated, brought everything they could to North Africa. And that Egypt battle, oof, that was, that was going to be the tight odds to begin with. And uh, he rolled exceptionally well, hit all of his twos. And so um, one infantry left there for the Italians. The French actually took a shot and uh, threw the two infantry that they had in there. Uh, missed, and one of them got hit. So... Uh, retreated the other one in order to protect this bomber. It was worth it to give it a go and uh, see what happened. Unfortunately, it didn't work out quite that way. But reconstituting another fleet here in C-Zone 101 with the planes that came out of Scotland. Uh, they were positioned so that they could have landed in Nenetsia. In fact, could have done that. That's why those uh, Americans are there. 
Um, shoot, I actually meant to pull those back. But um, in any event, that would that would have been stupid because they would have been exposed to the Germans. And speaking of Germans, let's see what they do in turn 12. Halfway through turn 12, and this was a big, big consequential round. Every country that was played so far. Uh, so in the Pacific, of course, uh, Japan rebuilding Navy in Season 6, as you would uh, have to expect. Uh, the subs, though, that managed to stay in convoy range, uh, all six dice that they rolled missed, so they didn't succeed in convoying anything, which is just horrible. Um, not nearly as horrible, though, as the result down here. So, you know, we, we discussed, we anticipated him perhaps attacking, um, perhaps it amounting to a reset since uh, the two navies were fairly evenly matched, but boy, the dice didn't roll that way. That's what's left after he wiped out the navy that was there and the two planes that scrambled from Queensland. Uh, so yeah, the, you know, the little ships, the subs are gone. There's still a destroyer there though, so I can't even get off any surprise shots on him. And uh, there are three full carriers there. That's terrible. This is really, really bad. So uh, that is not a good result for the U.S. and on the Pacific board, which had been my strength up until now. Um, over on the, in China, you know, China doing what China does here in, in terms of uh, the Japanese forces there. Um, this is a standstill here now in, in West India. Um, him not building anything in India, that, that at least was one positive consequence of um, the force I've been putting into the Pacific is that he couldn't build in India anymore. I haven't run the numbers. I'm fairly certain I can't take West India and I'm fairly certain that's why he threw everything there. Um, but I don't think he'll be able to take me either, especially since he's not building anything. Uh, that at least will take a little bit of pressure off and allow the UK to get up and help Russia, which of course it's going to need to do very soon. Um, so there was a big battle on Russia's turn that actually went positively for the Allies. You'll remember there's a big stack of 11 artillery and other stuff there in Volgograd. Well, there's still two artillery left after they took out everything that had been built up in Rostov. All the Italians that had been piled there, all the Germans, uh, and we were able to take that stack out and it stopped the advance uh, for at least another turn. Uh, of course, the Germans are still... Um, pushing forward like a tsunami. They just keep coming more and more, another wave every turn. Now there's a stack of infantry in Nenezia that uh, Russians are likely not going to be able to do anything about, which means uh, that could very well uh, get past me in the Urals and start gobbling up uh, Siberia. Because I I didn't even take Tambov like I could have, or Bryansk or Smolensk. I could have done all of that. Uh, but with all those bombers still there in Romania and the infantry that are able to get in, that means he can parachute more. And uh, I'm at the point where I'm worried about Russia falling, so I need to be very, very conservative on that. Um, little doom and gloom uh, foreshadowed by Germany's turn as well. Uh, you'll see those four subs in Season 98, which... Um, <laughs> used to be in the blow-up box, but you'll see there's no blow-up box indicator now there because everything in the box done got blowed up. Um, he brought the Air Force down as I suspected he would, but you know the consequence of me not being able to take Cairo last turn meant that this Navy was split in two. These, all these allied forces couldn't join this Navy here, which meant it was susceptible to the German Air Force and boy, uh, did they roll really well and my guys roll really poorly and that battle just went really really well for the Axis So now they've got all this Air Force still left over. I think he lost two bombers. Uh, that was it two bombers um, You know, I take that back. No, there were no bombers lost um, he built two and He's still got the this amount of plane and tax left over um, so oh boy, That was really bad in the meantime, the German Navy coming down here, taking Gibraltar, positioning itself in a position where the U.S. has now got to do something with this Navy over here, um, while at the same time trying to figure out what to do with Japan. So that was a really, 
really strong turn for the Axis and could very well have been a game breaker uh, for the Allies. We'll see what they can cobble back together for momentum on the rest of turn 12. We switch dice because we're on turn 13 now. U.S. has built nothing in the Pacific, uh, which is dangerous given all this stuff that Japan has, but they're out of position uh, for a turn. So um, that I attempted sorely to shoot these things because they're damaged. They're in a way they could lose planes, but I just don't have the stuff to cover it. Um, so I regroup there, focus all the U.S. effort in the Atlantic this time around. Uh, we finally, with some, oh my goodness, we, the U.S. actually lost a plane doing this, um, but we finally took Cairo. So uh, U.K. has jet power now, so it built some jets down here. That increases the uh, attack value. Um, and we moved up to start convoying Italy, but uh, U.S. did everything it could to attack this navy here in 1991, the German one. Um, but got, I mean, got about as much damage on it as I re reasonably could have expected, I guess. I didn't roll badly, but I didn't roll great. Um, and took out some stuff. Why? Well, why was, why was that worth it? Um, because I want to keep them from wiping out all these subs as much as possible. Took out its subs and, and uh, well, one of the destroyers anyway. Um, so questionable whether that was ultimately worth it. This is what I built in um, 101. Hopefully that's enough to defend the U.S. It's a little thin. I think it'll work. We'll see what the Germans do on turn 13. Halfway through turn 13 and the Allies' worst fears are coming true. Um, not only is Japan reconstituted there, um, but the damaged fleet pulled back to Java and built a naval base there so they can get fixed up next turn. Um, clever move, I think, on Chris's part, um, which puts them right in striking distance of Sydney. Of course, there are no transports there. That's the one upside from what the U.S. did last turn. There are two transports way up north as he's starting to take hold of Siberia. Uh, but otherwise no transports anywhere on the board. So uh, Australia at least has a couple turns of breathing room. Uh, that's not necessarily comforting, especially I think when that naval base is probably not meant for Australia. It's probably meant for uh, the Middle East. Uh, especially, you see there's a, a pullback here, but I think that's only a tidal thing. They're gonna pull back and then relaunch again real quick like. Um, in part because the UK's days of manufacturing here in the Middle East are numbered. Chris has taken a uh, 180 with Germany and while continuing to advance, you'll see that he advanced all the way to uh, Urals now with uh, no s sign of stopping anytime soon. Uh, Russia, you know, burst out and took back some of the territories surrounding Moscow. That's all well and good. They'll lose them again. Uh, but for once, Chris is not built in either of his factories in Eastern Europe, but rather eight uh, transports up there, taking the sea lion route. And of course, as often happens, if you're going to pull that move in the middle of the game, it's because you know you're going to win. And he's got enough here. Uh, I'm just running some paper numbers here uh, to show that I can build whatever I want there. He's going to tear through it like paper. So I'm not even going to bother to build, I don't think, in London this turn. Especially our house rules um, give UK some breathing room if they lose London. Um, but boy, um, it's ugly. Uh, US got set back a couple turns ago, losing its navies on both sides of the board. And there's not a lot it can do on anything. Um, US has made... Some gains, allies have made some gains, but um, we're gonna press forward to turn 13, but it's looking grim for the allies. Beginning of turn 14, it's uh, still looking grim for the allies. The US has pulled back, invested heavily in subs as a counter-strike option in case Japan comes that way. And uh, you'll see it's done the same on the Eastern front as well, because there's not much more it can do. Um, UK has built all in the Middle East, uh, knowing that it's pointless to build in London because it's going to get overwhelmed so badly. 
uh, moved up into uh, the med here, uh, took some bonuses, uh, got a little bit of convoy, lost all the subs in 97 uh, to the to the uh, Italians there. That was pathetic. Uh, almost, almost as pathetic, but not quite, as the attack in Rostov, in which three aircraft all attacking at a four, because I got jet power, and three tanks took four rolls to uh, get rid of the three tanks in Rostov. In the meantime, losing all the uh, British tanks. Just so pathetic. Um, U.S., again, subs for the Counter-Strike, knowing that London's a goner. So, um, boy, uh, allies are on, teetering on the brink here as we go into turn 14. Halfway through turn 14, and the axis momentum continues. Uh, we've got a little bit of naval activity, uh, mostly just repositioning, building a naval base there in Java, presaging a, an Australian invasion for sure. Uh, half, most of the Navy actually moving back up to India and reinforcing with planes because uh, India's attack on West India did, did not go well. And so he built more there than he planned to and brought more planes back up than he planned to all to reinforce it from the British, who I'll have to run those odds, but with those kind of reinforcements, probably won't be able to take it. Uh, Germany, though, just going absolutely bonzo. Um, getting as far as Tim Guska and Evansy, um, and not showing any signs of stopping. The Japanese finally flipping the Mongolian rule, but not really caring at this point because Russia is so weak. Uh, Russia snapped back and took a few more territories, but, uh, it's hanging on by a thread as, uh, Germany also takes London this turn and has, what, 117 IPCs to spend next turn. So, uh, allies are really hanging by a thread. All right, after further consideration, the uh, Allies, a.k.a. me, have indeed thrown in the towel on this game. Um, is it 100% sure that the Axis will win? No. Um, I particularly hate to see India go because I think I have a good chance of taking that back. But um, suffice to say, the Axis are running away, and I was not able to slow their momentum enough so uh, i did mess with them in china did mess with them in india but um and anzac you know had a pretty good game all things considered but there are just a couple critical moves here uh that slowed down the allies and you know kudos to chris for uh sticking with his axis strategy we played this game and the prior game really back to back with each other and uh, in both games chris was the axis and kind of refined his strategy after uh loss last time and uh it worked out well so uh i as the allies um also you know made a couple moves that were in retrospect probably not the best uh the one turn a turn or two ago where the u.s lost its entire navy on both sides of the board in one turn uh certainly didn't go well um i sacrifice the american navy up north very early in the game to get those planes to moscow and you know that held off germany at the time but certainly um didn't hold them off permanently um losing all those planes in kazakhstan was a huge blow to the allies and you know they, they were there for a reason they were there to stop the japanese advance uh in Singhai. And then uh, the German advance from the other side as well. But, um, you know, it was a reset. It certainly took out the German army down there, but took out way too much for uh, the Allies. It ultimately uh, benefited the Axis more. Losing that American fleet here in uh, C-Zone 98 uh, didn't help. And, of course, that was only because the British failed to take Cairo in time for the fleet in 81 to join up there and make it... Uh, impervious to those bombers so that didn't help and you know that was the same turn that we lost the american fleet in the pacific um uh, i mean last turn yeah i elected not to defend london and maybe i could have taken out a good chunk of the german bombers um certainly the way i've been rolling this game that wouldn't have happened but uh, it's possible uh the the rolls there ended up being decent if i had more units there it may have made a difference but you know then i'm taking units out of india too so fact was by, by the time that point of the game came around it was really too late 
uh, for the allies. The, the die, I think, was already cast in, in that respect. So, yeah, you know, Chris's Axis strategy of uh, pounding Russia with Germany um, worked out well for him. I, as the Allies, was not able to capitalize on that by putting enough pressure on Germany to slow him down. Um, I also you know, invested into this Middle Eastern strategy, which, you know, is doing what it's supposed to do, but obviously uh, left London too weak and um, just all in all didn't, didn't click. Some of the rules didn't go my way. Some of the strategic choices probably weren't ideal. And uh, Chris was just able to get that economic engine going uh, faster than I was able to slow it down. Uh, Chris really also likes this major factory in Romania, giving him a lot of options pumping into southern uh, Russia. Really reminiscent of the uh, sired blood, what does he call it? The sucker punch strategy, something to that effect, of, um, of really going into southern Russia where the high IPC value t territories all are. That's ultimately what Chris did. And ultimately, just as I try to do with the uh, Axis, these Italian territories uh, boosted Italy's economy um, and made up for losses in Africa. Uh, losses which I was not able to capitalize on quickly enough, probably. But in any event, that's where the game stands, as we call it here on Turn 14. And hope you enjoyed the show. Let us know what you think of the strategy and the strategic choices in this game. And we'll be back at you next time. Signing out.